Yeah, so David, we're, we're glad that you're joining us today and we look forward. Now, I know many people may be familiar with you, probably primarily through some of your books, because I know your books are often shared among us. And so we're thankful for those. I know um, your book, Christians Get Depressed Too, I think was my first, the first book that I read of yours. And um, I know I handed that out to lots of different folks and just, it was, it's a very helpful, very accessible book. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that uh, I, I mentioned this to David yesterday when we were talking, when, when I think of someone who, who loves the Lord, loves his word and loves his people and, and brings that together. Well, it's, it's David Murray. And um, again, I'm not trying to, to butter you up, although maybe a little bit. So we have a great conversation, but I am just thankful for you and for your work. And I know that work has blessed many across the Christian Reformed Church. So, so David, welcome. And uh, this is kind of how we're going to handle uh, this afternoon. It's going to be a lot of Q&A. So all of you, please um, just think of your questions because we're going to be talking about pastoral care primarily. Some different angles on that, but we want to hear what your questions are. And, and David is well equipped with that, has done a lot of work in these areas. And so we're thankful for that. But um, if you could take your questions and, and throw them in the chat and then we can grab them from there and interact with you on those questions. But Dave is just going to open up with a few words. And then, yeah, after just a few minutes, we're going to jump right into the Q&A. And uh, here we go. So, David, yeah, welcome. We're, we're so glad you're here with us. Thank you, Chad, and the Abide Project for this kind invitation. Um, I am trying to approach this subject from a pastoral background. i am been a pastor now coming up for... 30 years, and a lot of these issues have arisen in just the last, you know, decade or so. So had a lot to struggle through myself, and no doubt made some missteps along the way. Mm. But I think the, with the benefit of time and God's people working together, searching the scriptures, praying together, and then working it out in pastoral, practical, everyday life, I think clarity is emerging as to uh, the way ahead and the way to address this from a, a Christian perspective. And uh, maybe I can, I'd just like to basically try and frame our discussion, our questions and answers around um, four biblical principles that I try to be guided by. And the first one, I think, is where we, we have to start, and that's right theology, that we have done our work, we have executed the Bible, we have discerned God's mind, we have derived right conclusions, and that we have communicated these in a, an accurate, careful way. I think that's where the majority of our work has been done. In, in the last five to ten years in the conservative reformed churches. I think uh, a lot of really thorough biblical theological work has been done with the text of scripture and we have uh, got clarity, we have become sharper in our understanding and our ability to communicate that. So I I don't think that is such a big issue, at least amongst ourselves here in the Abide Project. Uh, but I think there are three other areas that I would like to see us grow in. And the first is what I, could, I saw recently called radical gentleness. Now, there are different ways to describe this. I've seen it described in the book, um, uh, compassion and courage, I think it's called, or courage and compassion. So you could put these together, courageous compassion, compassionate courage. But I really like this expression, radical gentleness. And I saw it actually just last week, you can look it up in an article on the Gospel Coalition website. It's called Radical Christian Gentleness in an Era of Addictive Outrage, and it's by George Marston, a Jonathan Edwards scholar, who has derived from Jonathan Edwards, not just a, a right theology, but this idea of radical gentleness. And what Marston is basically saying, as Edwards also said, is that we, we're living in an age 
marked by anger, grievance, and resentment. And that includes Christians, especially on social media. And Marson highlights how Edwards insisted that an essential trait of every true Christian is the lamb-like, dove-like spirit and temper of Jesus Christ, and insists on that as a fundamental of the faith, and shows it really compellingly from Scripture, especially in the writings of Paul, who's of course a very right theologian, but then shows how they're also part of Christ's essence and character, this radical gentleness. And he's coined this phrase because he saw in Christians, as Marston is seeing in our own day, maybe an overemphasis on our militaristic impulse. There's, there's no question that the Bible speaks of the Christian life and the Christian witness in military terms. And we've got this warfare image We've got this manly militancy, you might say, but that has become our default in almost every situation. I saw a picture of some Presbyterians recently who were gathered together for fellowship and discussion, and they put a picture up on social media afterwards. And I just about ran a mile away from it. It was so scary. It was like, how can we communicate uh, the most a military pose possible in a, a way that, you know, will show our manliness. And it, actually, all it reminded me of was the Pharisees, to be honest. Mm. And I think we we need to avoid the, the social contagion of this default anger and indignation and really work more on this lamb-like, dove-like spirit and temper of Jesus Christ. And that's not to say we're never strong and or bold, not at all, um, but that there should be a gentleness in that radical um, love of righteousness and truth. And he says, you know, a lot of people who are very strong in the militant, aggressive, fighting stance, against enemies outside of us have actually very little militancy against the enemy within them. Mm -hmm. The anger, the impatience, the pride, the self-aggrandizement. And I think he's, he's really put his finger on a very important point here that, you know, before we go into war against external foes, we have to do that war in our own souls and really seek to quell our unchristlike motives and manners with the help of the Holy Spirit. And I just, I'll close this little section with a quote from Edwards. Marston says that Christ resisted, could, could have resisted his oppressors with the fierceness of a roaring lion, but he instead showed his valor as a gentle lamb. If we are to follow Christ in boldness and valor, it should not be in the exercise of any fiery passions, not in fierce and violent speeches and vehemently declaiming against and of crying out of the intolerable wickedness of the opposers, giving them their own plain terms, but in not opening his mouth when afflicted and oppressed, in going as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears is dumb, not opening his mouth, praying that the Father will forgive his cruel enemies because they knew not what they did. So it's simply an appeal to add radical gentleness, not mere meek, weak gentleness, but radical, strong gentleness mm. to our right theology. And then the third area that I feel we could really do a better job in is in showing people not just what is right, but what is good. So, you know, we can argue very much in terms of this, our approach to Christian ethics is right. It's right and that's wrong. This is right and that's wrong. But the Bible also highlights the, the beneficial outcomes 
of right theology and right ethics. And you look, for example, through the book of Proverbs especially, you have a lot of emphasis on the physical, emotional, moral, spiritual, vocational, relational benefits that flow from a Christian life and a Christian ethic and a Christian faithfulness to God's word. And I think some secular studies are actually helping us here increasingly, at least the ones that can get past the, the censors in our mainstream media. Uh, you, have, you have people who have looked at the impact of a, a homosexual lifestyle, for example, on mental health, um, on relational stability, on overall happiness, and so on. You get people who have looked at the impact of gay adoption of children and how that impacts them. Mark Regeneris has done amazing work in that. Um, and you've got increasingly the research that is coming out on those who transition uh, genders. And, uh, you know, we're, we're being provided with a lot of evidence increasingly of the, the pain, the sorrow and the misery of uh, a life that is contrary to the Bible and the biblical ethic. And I think we want to really use that. It's something that is very helpful. It's it's not pure pragmatism, because we're not starting there. We're not making that the whole, but it's definitely a strain of teaching in Scripture, and we don't just need faith in Scripture to believe that. Because as I've said, a lot of research is coming out now, and, and helping us to see that uh, Scripture is being proven empirically in areas like educational attainment, mental, physical health, uh, relational stability, even things like criminal records. And we're speaking generally here, of course, it doesn't apply to everyone, but in general, there's there's just a, a, a much more miserable life that ensues when we turn away from the word of God. So right theology plus radical gentleness plus beneficial outcomes. And then the fourth area that I would really like us to use in approaching these issues pastorally is a careful flexibility mm. in terms of who we are dealing with. Because what I've seen, and I've seen the tendency in myself, we like simplicity, and therefore we we like to reduce things to one response. So like there'll be some, and the only response they have is the military declamation, condemnation, um, aggressive opposition. And then there'll be others who you know want to be super gentle and you know nice and you know loving and and so on. And I think what both both extremes there are making the mistake of everyone we deal with is the same and they're not and so I try to split people up um, in a way that hopefully helps me be flexible in my application of right theology radical gentleness and beneficial outcomes of, so under the, the category of non-Christians, I, I see three kinds of people, especially in this area of lesbian, gay, even transgender issues. You've got, first of all, the very militant non-Christian lesbian stroke gay opponent of Christianity. Okay, you've got the, you know, the out and the proud, they're mm -hmm. strident, they are aggressive. They are expansionist. They are out not just to get a place for themselves, but to squeeze Christians out of any place in polite society, uh, so-called. So you've got that. You've got that very militant non-Christian. Then, then you've got the, the very quiet non-Christian lesbian or gay person. And actually, that's the majority of lesbian and gay people, although they are not highlighted in the media. Right. In general, they don't go on pride marches. 
They're not dedicated to the destruction of Christianity, although, of course, their lifestyle is, is undermining of it. But but they, they go about their life fairly quietly. They just they just live their their homosexuality, their lesbianism isn't everything about them. So I think we've got to be careful to distinguish that very militant non-Christian from that quiet non-Christian who is living as a lesbian or gay person. And then that third area is the non-Christian who's struggling with this as a temptation. Uh, they, they have not committed, <clears throat> at least as a lifestyle, to a homosexual lifestyle. They, they've got some sense of discomfort with it, whether it's conscience telling them it's wrong or just the social consequences of it. And so they, they, they don't really have Christian reasons for not engaging in it, but some sort of common grace morality some social restraint maybe and so in that non-christian category there are three that i think we take these four areas of biblical truth radical gentleness beneficial outcomes and flexibility and and apply wisely in different proportions and then under the christian heading because you know we're, we're also dealing with christians in this area as well you've got a militant Christian who is a campaigner for lesbian and gay Christians within the Christian community. And as far as I can see, I'm willing to be corrected in that, but I think there are even some within the Christian Reformed Church oh, establishment, certainly. right? Certainly. Um, they've made this their life's mission or a major part of it to push this, to promote this, uh, using language of people like us, which is extremely hostile and damaging. And I actually view this kind of person as far more dangerous than any of the non-Christian opponent, okay? Um, I think this is as close as you can get perhaps to the Pharisee of Jesus's day because they are using the name of religion as a guise right. and as a disguise for their own lives as well. So you've got that militant Christian campaigner. Then you've got the Christian who's given into lesbian and gay temptation and is living a, a lesbian stroke gay lifestyle, style, often persuaded by those who are militant Christian campaigners for lesbian and gay Christians. Um, and then you've got Thirdly, the Christians who have resisted the gay lifestyle, but they've adopted a gay Christian identity. So they are celibate, they are fighting uh, the temptation, but they do identify themselves as gay Christians because they have that struggle. And then fourthly, you've got Christians who struggle with lesbian and gay temptation. They would never describe themselves as a gay Christian, but it's just a very usually very private, hidden, invisible struggle. And so with these three non-Christian categories, four Christian categories, I think a different approach is needed that takes a lot of wisdom and prayer, and, and it's extremely challenging. I like simple. This is not simple. And therefore, I, I'm just trying very hard to really work through these complications as I try to apply biblical theology, radical gentleness, and beneficial outcomes. No, thank you. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right in saying that this is this is not simple. But I, I, even now, just sitting here, your, your categorization, it, it sort of like just helps to put things into a, a framework that we can think it through, you know, so I appreciate that a whole lot. I mean, so I, I know, um, I really, I'm really curious about this whole idea of the radical gentleness as well, but I want to kind of start where we where you left off, just so we can kind of flow from that. So just thinking about, you know, um, I guess dealing with these different groups. You know, you, you talked about different ways we we would we would deal with those who are you know more of a militant you know spirit, or those who are struggling with a temptation, and sometimes we've used the. The, the shepherd has a different voice for the sheep than he does for the wolves. I mean, so some of that comes into play here a little bit. Um, 
I, I guess maybe t- talk about that a little bit. I, I'm thinking about so pastoral care. We got a lot of pastors in this group, you know, as mm-hmm. as we're dealing. I think first of all with Christians. Um, how what what kind of a voice do we need to have? Because we're going to have a, a a spectrum of these within our congregations. Maybe some of us don't have quite the militant folks within our congregations, but we're dealing mm-hmm. with them within our denomination. But can you just talk a little bit more about what how, how do you how would you speak to them in a very like very pragmatic ways? Yeah, I think I think you're right, Chad. The the majority of people in our own more conservative churches are going to be the last two categories. Right. There'll be some who who have adopted that gay Christian identity, maybe not realizing the the significance or the danger of it. And we can come back to that. But I think or, the majority or I find that, you know, especially people with family members or parents with children, you mm-hmm. know, and, and they themselves aren't struggling with it personally. I mean, the, their own personal desires, but with their own children. How do you sort through that stuff yep. too? But, sorry, yep. good job. So, yeah, I think the majority of people in our churches are probably more of that very private struggle. They they have not identified as gay Christians and would be appalled at the idea. But it's a very real, genuine struggle in in a godly person. It's just part of their flesh spirit struggle. So, um, yeah, I've had a number of people in my office with this, and I was thinking through it this morning. I don't. I didn't have any like formal steps, but as I thought through, I realized I was following some steps as I stood. So, the first step I've often t- always taken is to listen, whether that's to the parents or the grandparents or to the person themselves, and really listen. I mean, don't cut it short. Just let them go and let them tell their story. There's often so much pain, especially in someone struggling with this temptation and who has given into it so I, I, that's where i want to start just being very quick and long to listen and then secondly while you know saying some few words of a general assurance of god's overall sovereignty and power and grace and mercy i really i usually ask for time to think so i you know i don't think people want quick answers they want to see this uh, thoughtful person who is taking this very seriously, who's not jumping in, who's going to take time to sort of enter into my story and pray it through and then come back with, with some words. So, yeah, I don't leave them with nothing, but I generally emphasize my need to think and pray and really live this story through my mind. You know, And, and then thirdly, take that time to pray over it on my own or with somebody else. And that would be my fourth step. And that's consult conscious that a lot of these situations are very new to me. I'll consult with other pastors, with my elders, with maybe people I've I've known like Christopher Ewan, like Rosaria Butterfield. I've done that quite a few times. Um, Even if I am pretty sure I know the way to go, I always like to check. And each time you do that, you need to do it less going ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I, I then I come to speak. I'll you know arrange to meet with them again. And I'm trying to share the Bible. I'm trying to share some of the statistics. Um, but above all, I'm trying to share stories, stories from the Bible, stories of people who have had similar experiences, who have come through, thankfully, as the Christian church has been blessed with people like Christopher Yuan and Rosaria, um, Sam Albury, uh, Jackie Hill Perry, who have who have written very candidly about their struggles that we can share with people. So it's not just, you know, well, you're just a heterosexual white male, you know, it doesn't know anything. Um, and then I think assure people that whatever they choose going forward, you're not going to abandon them. You're not going to walk away from them. Um, you're not going to stop loving them. You obviously put very clearly before them the biblical teaching in as gentle a way as possible. You put before them the benefits of this lifestyle that is biblical, the opposite of it's unbiblical. Uh, but just say, look, 
I'm not giving up on you. Whether this takes one year, five years, 10 years, I'm going to be here. Now, at that point, a lot of some people, I shouldn't say a lot, but some people say, if you don't agree with me 100%, you're out of my life. Um, you know, I, I had a, a couple recently who who had a granddaughter, and that, that was basically it. If, unless they gave 100% affirmation of her choices, that was it. And, well, that will have to be it. But we will keep sending you birthday cards. We will keep sending you Christmas cards. We will keep coming to Thanksgiving. Um, no, we cannot have you and your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is staying overnight in our house, but you're always welcome. You know, to just be strong with gentleness and then wait. Hmm. And I know that's the worst word in the world for us today. We hate it. But it's 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 just not going to be a flip of a switch. It's just not going to be, aha, I see it. Yes, yeah, true, it's wrong Bible, so I'm going to change. No, a lot of these things are either lifelong or they're habits that have been engaged in, indulged in for some weeks, months, years. They're not easy to, to change. And therefore, waiting for people, hoping that the Spirit of God will strive with them and work with them to um, give them light and desire, change desire. So listen, think, pray, consult, speak, assure, and wait. Wait. That is a hard word. I mean, um, it, to be patient with one another. And, you know, especially it seems, I mean, we know these things have, have always been around, you know, when we deal with, you know, struggles with human sexuality, particularly homosexuality, now transgenderism, that's much more recent, but it does, it all feels like it's rushed onto the scene so, scene so quickly. So it feels like we need to, to kind of quick react against it. You know, we see it, I, I would imagine many in our congregations, uh, many have kind of kept their head low, those who've been struggling with especially homosexuality and those sorts of things that they maybe haven't felt like they can bring it up at all. And, and so, yeah, when it comes up, you're like, well, you got to kind of squelch it and get it kind of taken care of right away. Like, like, let's just fix this in the moment. And that, and then that kind of leads to the quick frustration. Mm -hmm. So I loved how you, I love how you even just say the asking for the time to think. So there's patience and waiting kind of all the way through the process. It's not a, a, a quick fix by any means. Um, so as, as you're thinking about this, um, yeah, I, um, where is there ever, does there ever come a time where you do sort of um, kind of cut off the connection? I mean, so, so you, you got a parent or you're even you're pastoring um, someone and uh, yeah, they say no, and you keep kind of coming to Thanksgiving, like you said, and um, I, I guess maybe what is what are some of the compromises we should be making? What are some of the compromises we shouldn't be making when it comes to pastoring? And, and I'm not not everybody here is a pastor, so I don't want to just sit, sit in that realm. But we're all discipling one another in some way. But what compromises should we make, and what should where should we draw lines? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, when you're think, talking about drawing the lines, you're concerned, obviously, with the person and the impact on them. Mm -hmm. You're concerned about your witness and whether it's going to be compromised or confused if you don't draw a line. And, and you're above all concerned with God, mm -hmm. and his, his, glory. his eye upon you and his blessing upon you. And sometimes I think we, we focus too much on the impact on that person, the impact on our witness. And just to bring God into this and use that as our ultimate determiner, because, you know, who, who can tell consequences? We can guess the consequences for them. We can guess the consequences for us. But we do know, without guessing, what God says is right and wrong. And, again, I think a lot depends on the character, the, the nature of the person that you're dealing with. Uh, obviously, if it's somebody who is very militant, aggressive, pushy, uh, the line has to be a lot clearer than, say, somebody who is 
either tempted or who has taken that gay Christian identifier, um, I would not personally go to a gay marriage because, I, 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 number one, I don't believe it is a marriage. And secondly, I would, would be concerned about the impact on the person and the impact on my witness. But most of all, I just don't believe God would have me there. I, one of the questions that I always go back to, I had it growing up in my church, you know, would you go to this place if you knew Christ could come back today? Hmm. And, you know, like I've often thought of that when, you know, I've, I've been watching a movie or something and things start going, you know, south morally or, you know, bad language. And so I think of that in, a, in that situation too. You know, would I would I want Jesus to come back while I'm here, at least with my body, um, at a gay marriage? So I think that question can maybe help. Uh, would how, and help us understand God's view of what we are what we are doing. Uh, I think the uh, from what I've seen, a lot of the challenge now is coming from. You know, will you? It's not so much will you come to my gay marriage, but will you accept my gay partner? It's, um, you know, will you have them in your house? And I would, I, I would, I would have, and I have had gay people in my house. I don't think that's a compromise. Jesus sat, he ate and drank with with sinners. Um, but it's another question altogether to go to a what you know, God exclusively reserved for man and woman uh, marriage, and you know, pretend that this is okay, um, right, right. stealing a word from God for a relationship that He has put a stamp of disapproval on. So I, you know, I, I want to really try and figure out what that means in our own day to eat and drink with sinners to be hospitable. You know, Rosaria, it's not a mistake that she has written so strongly against homosexuality and for hospitality. Right. And I think she has got that beautiful combination of radical gentleness in a way maybe I've never seen it in, in anyone else. And um, I, I, that's why I'm, I guess that's, she's my model in a way for my approach. And at times I think like there was one thing we had to and fro, I thought, mm, that's a bit strong, you know. But then as I looked into it more, I realized, no, it's not too strong. She sees much further down the road here. And nobody blows Rosaria Butterfield over. I mean, no, she, no. she is, I mean, she, she's not a big package, but I'll tell you, she has a great punch. But yeah. it, if you talk about someone who, who loves people that are other than her... Well, I mean, where she was before, but other than herself, she she knows. And yeah, I love her story about how yeah, you know, hospitality is is really was was the on was the her her entry into the gospel. Hmm. Hmm. You know, that pastor in her hometown or where it was a Syracuse, I believe it was, and just yep. having her over. That patient, long term view of, of of pastoral care and ministry together. Hmm. Yeah. We don't have the quick answers for all these things. That's for sure. No. Yeah. One of the um, one of kind of the, the four guiding principles you talked about were the beneficial outcomes. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. You know, just you know, um, God's way is the best way, right? You know, yeah. and, and we're we're committed to that. But but practically speaking, and how that is even borne out in. We can, you know, sometimes we use the term common grace, mm -hmm. but, you know, in some ways in the, in sort of the, the, the general providence that God has, can you just talk a little more about that? I mean, where have you seen that? What are some of the, maybe even some of the statistics you've seen and, and that sort of right. stuff? I got into this really, I was studying Matthew Henry for quite a long time and came across the last book he ever published, which was The Pleasantness of the Christian Life. Based on Proverbs 3.17, all her paths are pleasantness and all her ways are peace. And he used the pleasantness or the happiness, the 
benefits of the Christian life in an apologetic way Hmm. that was very common in his day in that latter Puritan era when the influence of Puritan reform movement was fading, when the Enlightenment was rising, and people were turning away from churches that had been very divided by civil war and the wars of religion. And they were like the idea of objective truth was very much, you know, being reasoned away. And therefore, he and others like him rose up in that day with this new approach, which is still biblical, but is very suited to the context of his day, which was to really emphasize the benefits and blessings of the Christian life and the opposite. And that it really struck me, you know, these were Puritans, these were reformers. And we would tend to associate a lot of their arguments with the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. And when I first started talking about this, or even preaching about it, I had, I had some reform people who come to me and say, hey, David, are you trying to be the new Joe? The reformed Joe Lostian here. And if that were possible, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> and it's like there was a huge suspicion yeah of the idea of Christian happiness, Christian joy, the benefits of the Christian life. And, and I agree with the suspicion, if that's all you've got, and, and you never, you know, you don't have an apologetic for suffering either, which Joel Osteen doesn't. Right, 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 right. Um, but there's nothing wrong in a supplementary way with using the benefits of the Christian life, the pleasantness of religious life, to advocate for the truth, to get a hearing for the truth as well. And so, yeah, I've always been interested. I've collected a lot of stats over the years. I often use them in my sermons about the uh, just the, the secular research on things like, um, you know, what, what does a homosexual lifestyle lead to? It leads to more disease, more mental illness. I think it's a nine year shorter lifespan really um you look at the the transgender statistics that are coming out those who have transitioned and it's it's even within the transgender community those who transition it's 50 percent higher mental illness uh, suicide um yeah relational breakdown you, you look at Mark Regenerative's work, especially on offspring from homes with a single parent or unmarried um, parents, and the impact of that on education, happiness, uh, mental health, the likelihood of them resulting, becoming a bisexual, lesbian, or gay, um, more far more likely to have sexually transmitted diseases, be sexually molested themselves. Uh, unemployment rates are much higher. Income levels are much lower. Uh, much greater chance of being involved with criminal, the criminal um, system, penal system. Um, the, these stats, you know, they'll never appear on ABC, CBS, NBC. They'll never appear in the Times or New York Times, Washington Post, but they are out there. And yeah, people try and quash them and then obviously character assassinate the authors. But I, I think we want to use that because, you know, the argument is often used if you don't let them transition or you don't, right. if you disapprove and con you know, condemn their you know, gay lifestyle or the game, you're going to make them commit suicide. You're going to end up, you know, giving them mental illness. You're going to, no, 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 no. <laughs> the stats are very much the opposite. The Bible's very much the opposite, but the, just the bare empirical stats are very much opposed to that as well. And, and they don't see that. They'll never see that in the media. They'll never see that in the movies, in the sitcoms, in the songs that, are popular in our culture. And I think that's, you know, we are up against a tsunami, a, a cultural tsunami. You know, growing, when we were growing up, Chad, you and I, well, we're in our 80s now or something like, oh, no, no, it's 50s, aren't we? Yeah, we're 50, yeah. Close. Um, you know, although there was always the immorality movement, even the movies were not 
always immoral you know the, in the songs yeah. not always like yeah of course it's always still a tendency but today yeah you just can't get a series you can't get a a movie that doesn't promote this as wonderful and you know the best way forward so we're up against it but you know greater is he who is with us than they who are with the world you know, we will hear that that very argument. You know, we need to change the way we view human sexuality. We'll hear it right on the Senate floor because our children are going to you know, suffer from mental mental illness if we don't. They're gonna they're they're more likely to 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 you know take their life if we don't make a change if we don't allow them to transition, so to speak, mm -hmm. or to live that fully. Um, so yeah. I, and I agree, everything that I have read, too, is, is is the same. I mean, it just confirms what Scripture has told us about, you know, the, the blessing of, of following God's way. Now, you you had mentioned somebody, you mentioned Mark, and I can't remember his last name. Yes, I think it's Mark Regenerus, R-E-G-E-N-E-R-U-S. I think that's his name. Let me just check that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think even just having some some of those those folks to go to, um, Scripture is our authority, of course, and and I, I that's one of the things I know you you're, you emphasize that as well too. But to see how 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 life kind of bears that out in in reality too, when we actually get down to the data, you know, of, of really what is happening, it bears out that that God's way is is the best way, absolutely. Yeah, and, and ultimately, Chad, of course, we're thinking of eternity. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, for it, sure. You know, what we can argue for the benefits of this. The other side can argue, you know, if you don't do this, they're going to be this, that, the next thing. Ultimately, you go to the judgment seat in unrepentant sin, you've got an eternity of pain and agony ahead of you hard though it is to resist our sin to fight our temptations um it's it's a breeze compared to eternity if we go there without we, we just lost your audio for some reason here can you still hear me david i can hear you yeah can everybody else hear david yeah i can david's fine so I just can't hear you. Everybody else can. So I just keep going. Sorry. Um, you can no, say whatever you want now, then. A bit no, you're back. <laughs> no, you say whatever you want. Exactly. No, you're back. Good. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, I just I, I found uh, found his website. So I plugged it in the chat here. If anybody's interested in just kind of at least following Mark Regenerous and kind of checking some of the things out. Now, we've got a few questions that are coming through us in the to us in the chat here. And um, I'd like to get to a couple of those. Um, Here's one. Somebody said when, when someone has not outed themselves, but has distanced themselves in the worship and service of the church, should we prioritize the more general unfaithfulness or the specific issue of desire, identity, behavior? Must be a Canadian because there's an extra you in there. But I, I'm thinking of those who have become uh, fringe baptized or professing members. And yeah, this is this is often how it happens, right? You know, people just sort of yeah. fade away from the church. Yeah. You know, they don't they don't come out and they don't make a, a loud and proud statement, but they just sort of like, yeah, I'm just going to kind of fade away. Then I don't have to deal with it. But so it really becomes an issue of the means of grace and neglecting the means of grace. So what would you say there? So I, I go back to Rosaria, and I hope I wouldn't be misrepresenting her here, but I think she would prioritize friendship mm. and hospitality, the you know relationship building, without at least initially in pressure to talk about that particular sin or that general situation, and yeah raise the general concern hey uh, you know you're not so interested in church let's talk you know i'd like to hear your story i i realize churches can hurt people there can be misunderstandings and try and just provide that relational capital so i think a lot of our problems arise in these situations when people drift away and then we go and try and chase up. We don't have any capital in the bank with them. We don't have any relational resources that have been built up over years. And now we appear 
when something is wrong. And so I think the importance of preemptive pastoring, preemptive friendships, relationships, whether that's pastors, elders, deacons, members, youth groups, the again, Rosaria really emphasizes just that church family. Then when you've got that there and somebody wonders, you've you've got a bit of leverage, you've got some capital to draw on. You you should get a better listening than, you know, oh well, you know, first time you've talked to me in 20 years sure. is, you know, when I I'm not turning up. Um and yeah, you can't really say much against that so i think build that relational capital over the years and then draw on it when the crisis occurs and continue even if the person is not coming to church try and continue a friendship keep meeting them keep loving them um it's not approving you know that i don't think we need to say that every time we meet with them but I think we're trying to get that opening that um, hopefully relational connection will give us so that we can speak the truth into that situation. And again, yeah, if a person is drifted from church and there's a gay homosexual element to that, um, you know, fundamentally the problem is more most likely a lack of saving faith in Christ, not a homosexual lifestyle. Right. And so we again we want to try and get to the roots. And that this is where I think people like John Piper have been so helpful. This, you know, the the treasuring of Christ, the savoring of Christ, the pleasure of Christ, um, being the supreme affection in our life that can, you know, quench every other lesser or sinful affection and to try and show people the satisfaction that can be found in him even if it means a life of celibacy you know yeah salvation for someone struggling with say homosexuality is not heterosexuality right you know their salvation is christ i mean it's a it's 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 their whole life and so really our sexual sin and our sexual temptations are just a a symptom hmm. you know w w right of, of the old man and the old self that is rearing his head and wanting yeah. to keep keep coming back so appreciate that emphasis there um i had one just a specific question i thought maybe this i know you are you are can have a lot of good resources and a lot of good recommendations but this was uh somebody asked recently it came to our attention that a couple in our small group have a son um who is same-sex attracted uh, my question is this, do you know of any resources that could that we could use to help this couple who are very concerned about their son and love him dearly? I, I love the I love the way that 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 question is phrased. I mean, to love this son dearly, but also the the church kind of coming around and how do we help this couple together? Yeah. Oftentimes we just want to kind of keep quiet about it. We don't maybe we just won't bring it up. but how do how do we come around each other and help each other in this? Or do you have any good resources that would? Yeah, you know, sources like the Gospel Coalition and Desiring God have produced, you can do a search for this. I did it this morning again. And I mean, they've got one page, 50 plus resources for people who are hmm. struggling with homosexuality issues. And it covers things like weddings, children, whatnot. Uh, there's there's really a you know, the main thing is a reliable source because you can put that search in and you can have a full range of answers but i found gospel coalition design god ask pastor john um i don't i don't think i've had a an ethical pastoral issue that i haven't found he's got an answer for mm. that i might not may not fully agree with him all the time but yeah, it, right. it's a good way of thinking through something biblically so it gets I, you in the right direction, at least, right? No. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so I would suggest do do your Google work with these two two resources in particular, and there are other good ones too. Um, Denny Burke has done some really good work. I haven't heard of him. The the books, of course, by Rosario, by Christopher, Sam Albury, Jackie Hill Perry, um, Compassion Without Compromise, 
Mm -hmm. I think it's a good book. Um, we had Ron Sitlow on here way early on. Oh, did you? Okay, okay. Yeah, Compassion Without Compromise is a, is a great resource. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's not that you'll get a specific answer maybe to your specific situation, but I think, again, you'll get principles and guidelines, tracks that you'll be able to apply prayerfully and thoughtfully to your own situation. And yeah, from what I've experienced, I think a lot of time is required and it's it's the hardest thing i mean i it's i've not had it in my own family mm. so i can't i can't fully enter into this definitely had it in my own pastoral life but yeah i would just urge you to bring keep god's family around you be open with a select you can't tell everybody everything it'll just because it, it'll eventually get back to your kid but people that you trust a handful of people to be prayer praying with you regularly over this and continuing to consult with them as each situation develops and new challenges emerge and one thing i take away is that we we, we always want quick answers and we'd like to have the, the quick solution but this does take work it takes time relationships all of those things and so it's an investment um, into one another mm. as we walk with each other. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know whether I believe in conversion therapy, Chad. Yeah, right. But I believe in conversion. Sure. It's far better. We might have way better. <laughs> and, and I've seen it happen. I, I know uh, somebody came to see me maybe five years ago who was not just struggling with temptation to homosexuality but was falling into it and god has worked in a mighty way and he's engaged to be married and mm. to a lovely christian girl i'm sure there'll be struggles but yeah god can work amazingly not that he'll take away every desire forever but sufficient to enable us to function as faithful christians in our time well, we've seen that. Oh, well, I mean, Rosaria is, is a is a great example of that herself, right? You know, and um, there there that that's not God's goal again is to is to bring us to to heterosexuality. But sometimes he he even brings that brings the companionship of of a husband and a wife together, even in the midst of sexual struggle, yeah. which probably. I mean, every every couple will have some degree of it to another, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's that's important to remember as well. No, no one has this perfectly aligned because we live a, in in a sin filled world and yeah. two sinners coming together in marriage. So, yeah. Um, question here: Someone said I'm a big fan of that word hospitality. Uh, my question is about fellowship among pastors. So I, I think this this maybe has implications. So this guy is saying, I've withdrawn from our local pastor prayer group because of the growing influence of the progressive churches. Um, where should we draw the line with regard to our fellowship with other churches? And of course, this kind of hits us in the Christian Reformed Church as we're leading up to Synod too. I mean, within our own denomination, we have churches that have declared their, their open opposition to what our synods have decided. And um, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm not talking, you don't have to speak to that specifically, but maybe as we're interacting with others in our own community, you know, so you're in a prayer group and boy, the, the influence of the progressive pastors or the pro, your progressive friends is kind of overtaking that group. Um, how, how do we, where, where, where does it come in time to say, okay, now it's time to, to separate and we're going to do our own group. We're, we're going to pray together over here separately. Yeah. I'm maybe not the best person to ask this, Chad, because um, I would just be out at the first sign of that. I, I yeah. just don't have time for it. And I, I can easily find pastors, faithful pastors to pray with um, anywhere. Right. It, it doesn't even need to be local. I just, I personally just, I'd be out. I, I don't have enough time in my life. Um, I'm never, and I'm not going to change these pastors, I don't think. But there are people who need me elsewhere. So I think it's, you know, there are times where you just dust off your feet, move on and, you know, join with like minded people. I don't have I've got enough battle in my own heart within my own 
um, membership, uh, to start battles with ministers in that area. No, that's not for me. I've been in those groups before too, where it ends up being a prayer battle, like in yeah. <laughs> see, so, and, and that it, it completely undermining the whole idea of the prayer, right? You know, you're 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 just trying to correct their theology in your own prayer, and they're trying to correct your, you know, what you're thinking in their in their yep. prayer. And it just doesn't work. And so, maybe just an encouragement to, to to everyone here. I mean, noon on Tuesdays, every Tuesday, there's a group that gets together via Zoom with the Abide Project to pray together, and um, they just visit the website, and you can. You can be connected to that group, and those will be a group of like-minded folks. Yeah, it's not local, but boy, that's a good that's a good fellowship. So, yeah, the I think it's a different thing, you know, within the courts of the church. That's a legitimate battle that that should be waged. But voluntary groups like that, where you know you don't yeah. have a moral obligation, no, I'm out. Yeah. No, uh, that's that's a good distinction there too. I mean, yeah, you know, in our especially at this stage of the game within our own synod, within our own denomination, we're bound together by by covenant and by um, voluntarily bound together by covenant. And so we do need to wrestle against one another. We can't just simply walk away from one another at this stage of the game. But but yeah, on, on those prayer group and those kind of things, we need to be built up with one another as well too. And it becomes inauthentic. Um, yeah. Yeah, as we go through, um, yeah, I'm just kind of checking out here. I don't know if you've looked at any of these uh, questions in the chat. If there's anything you would like to um, address, but we're we're getting to the top of the hour here and wrapping up soon. But um, yeah, I think there's that one there from Jim Panozo. Yeah, about how yeah people like Christopher Ewan Rosario but feel very radical conversions and transformations and um that there are others i think we distinguished some of them within the christian community who is still have that struggle it's still a dominant area i shouldn't say dominant i should say a a powerful influence in their lives that it's not been a complete you know black white um change and i think again rosaria has dealt with a lot of this and I brought a case to her once, and what she emphasized was just friendship, 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 friendship. Mm. That what attracted her to the gay community initially, lesbian community, was a friendship. They were expert at friendship. They just, it was like a family. And that is what is lacking in a lot of Christians' lives who are struggling with this temptation. And I don't I don't think it should be like, oh, let's have special groups for people, Christians who struggle with gay temptations. It's just, it's a temptation. Um, let's treat it like a temptation. Um, not be not be defined by it or identified by it, but but share it again in a trusting place with trusted people. And there's a real power in that. There is a massive power, just as men are experiencing with, you know, I know of a few groups around here, pornography mm -hmm. problems. Right. That accountability, that friendship, that weekly connection at least, the uh, regular check-ins, very powerful in breaking sin and weakening temptation. And I, I, I don't think there's that much yuck factor left I know people think, oh, if I tell people I'm gay, it'll be, oh, you know, as if it's some, you know, especially hideous devil. No, we're past that. Some of us may have had that, you know, at, at some sure. time in our life, if we grew up and like, you know, if you ever mentioned that in my school in Glasgow, you'd be taken up a, a dark lane and, if you know, it'd be knocked out of you. It, yeah, right. it's, we're past, it's not happening, you know. <laughs> Um, we're we're going to regard you as an equal sinner with ourselves, Amen. Um, and you can help me with my struggle, whether that's with anger or impatience or pride, just as much as I can help you with your struggle with sexual temptation. And we do need one another as much as we need the Lord, and above all. 
I think that's a great place to to kind of wrap up the conversation here, Dr. Murray. I mean, it, as we think about it, I mean, this is where it comes back down to the gospel, right? You know, we, we are all in need of Christ and the temptation that we all all bear. And, and so that's that way, as we as we think about walking with others, I mean, how can we come at it pridefully or with arrogance? Mm-hmm. You know, we we stand in the same need. And um, thankfully, the, thankfully, our Lord has met that need. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending this time together. And, you know, uh, Dr. Murray has a blog, um, Heart and Hand. Yeah, it's not very active today, Chad. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> Head, Heart, Hand was the blog. I, Head, I Heart, podcast, Hand. The Story Changer, that's on and off, shall we say. Okay. Uh, but you've, got, you've gotten busy with a congregation, so I can understand that uh, life on the outside is a little tougher to, to maintain. So thank you for all of your work and especially thank you for your time with us here. Um, that's, that's, it's been very helpful. And I think even just the challenge of, of moving us forward when it comes down to it, the, yeah, the, the whole, the, the, the whole topic is complicated. There's a lot of angles to it, but the simplicity of um, walking away from this, the, the simplicity of, of, re, of building relationships and just taking the time for one another. Um, a lot of work, but that that is a simple answer as we walk with each other to Christ. So thank you for challenging. Thank us you, today. Chad, and thank you to all the brothers and sisters who are faithfully working to uphold the faith and and apply the gospel in these situations. Whatever the eventual outcome of this synod or future synods, I really believe God's smile is upon you, mm-hmm. and He delights in that consistent gentle radical faith that is witnessing to his truth in the area of hottest battle today thank you for that would you mind uh, just closing this section in prayer then we'll have a couple of announcements afterwards but yeah sure appreciate that prayer David. let's pray together our wonderful God and Savior, we come to you so thankful that you have delivered us from our sins and increasingly from our sinfulness. We, all of us, come before you with our own weirdness, brokenness, sinfulness, thanking you for your ongoing work and above all for your forgiving work. We pray that you would help us as we try to bring the truth of the gospel in a gentle way, showing the benefits of the Christian life and really tailoring our message in a flexible way, depending on who we're talking to, so that the outcome will be more saved souls, more souls, more Christians delivered from temptation. We do pray that you would defeat those who are militantly pushing this unbiblical, uh, unholy, and unkind approach to sexual ethics outside the church and inside the church. Although it's hard for us to say this, Lord, we do pray like Christ did, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And yet sometimes we fear they do know what they do. We pray that just as it was so unlikely that Some days later, many hundreds of them would be converted in Pentecost. So in our own day, even those who are militant inside the church and outside the church would cry out, what must I do to be saved and seek true repentance and return to biblical faithfulness? We pray for all our brothers and sisters who struggle with temptation in this area in particular, that you would give them victories day by day, and ultimately give that great hope of full, final, and forever deliverance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Appreciate it. Look forward to connecting again. So, thank you. you in your ministry. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of announcements for everybody. Um, in two weeks, we will be having another one of these mass Zoom meetings in the evening. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin is going to be welcomed for the lecture series. And then at the end of May, May 30th, a Tuesday afternoon, we will have, I think it's afternoon, we'll have Jonathan uh, Van Maren, 
And so just a couple more good discussions. And then right before Senate, I think it is June 9, or right around in that range, uh, whatever the Tuesday Tuesday is, we're going to have a kind of a mass group prayer. You know, so besides our Tuesday after Tuesday noon uh, Eastern time uh, gathering, we're going to gather in the evening on that day just to pray specific, specifically for Senate and for the delegates and all of those who will be a part of us. So with that, blessings on your day, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.